With that, let's go ahead and begin today's event, once again sponsored by Verado and hosted by Health Data Management. It's my pleasure to turn today's call over to our moderator for today, and that is Fred Bazzoli, editor with Health Data Management. Fred, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's session, uh, Join the Patient Matching Revolution. Uh, critical time in the healthcare industry right now, uh, technologies that support patient matching are often in an uphill fight and often failing to link uh, patients to data when we most need that kind of success with the electronic health systems that providers are using nowadays. Uh, in this webinar, we're going to discuss a new patient matching technology called referential matching, uh, something that the Pew Charitable Trust has highlighted as a cornerstone opportunity for health systems to use in order to improve patient matching. Uh, on the call to discuss this today is Mark LaRoe, the CEO of Verado. Uh, he was formerly at MicroStrategy, a business intelligence software provider, and uh, he was uh, executive vice president of products there. And also on the call is Todd Rago. Uh, he's senior vice president uh, for and CIO at HealthX, uh, believed to be the largest public HIE in the in the country. Uh, Todd joined HealthX in 2015, and he's responsible for providing the vision, strategy, and day-to-day -day operational leadership uh, for all technical aspects of the company. Uh, for that, he was the CTO at Health InfoNet, which is Maine's state HIE, so he has a lot of experience in that uh, arena. Uh, Mark, I'd like to hand it off to you now and uh, begin with the, uh, today's webinar. Okay, thanks a lot, Fred. Hi, everybody. This is Mark LaRoe, and as introduced, I'm the CEO here at Verado, and I'm pleased to be with you on this webinar. Uh, and I'm pleased to have one of uh, one of the, um, the major movers and shakers in the, uh, the HIE space with you also to talk about what they're doing. And, you know, this webinar is here to answer the question, or it's to answer the question, what is referential matching, and um, how does it fit? What is, what, is, what is it all about, and why is it being talked about? So I hope I accomplish that in my 30 minutes and Todd's additional minutes, and we hope to leave plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, the agenda is relatively straightforward, even though it looks like there's you know a lot to get over here. Most of these are fairly bite-sized topics. I'm going to give a small introduction to Verado, then I'll talk about patient matching as being a foundation to most healthcare organizations, uh, the cost of inaccurate patient matching, and then the existing and, and I want to paint a picture for you most uh, poignantly as to why existing patient matching technologies are going to fail. And fundamentally, it's because we're putting more stress and more strain on them than they were ever designed to handle. And therefore, a new architecture is necessary, and that's referential matching. Uh, let me not uh, dwell too much on the agenda. Let me get right to the material. Uh, let me give you just a, an idea of Verado, the company, so you can put us into some context as you hear me speak and you hear Todd speak in a few minutes. But, you know, Verado is a software company. We're located here in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and we've got a new technology base for matching. And it's um, based upon a reference database, a very, very large database of reference identities, a brand new kind of algorithm called a referential algorithm, as contrasted with probabilistic matching, which is what's embedded in all of the current state-of-the-art MPIs. It also takes advantage of very big database technologies, meaning the storage and the retrieval of very large data sets so that our reference database can be used as an answer sheet in doing matching. This will become more clear as I present in a few moments, but uh, suffice to say, all of this technology we've assembled, it's brand new kind of technology to solve an old problem and that's, that's sometimes the only way you can make big movement on an old problem is to introduce new technologies. And I guess the other, the other thing important to note is that we're entirely cloud-based, so that um, all of the hardware, all of the software lives within our cloud, hundreds and hundreds of servers serving our customers at sub-second response times um, so that you don't have to deploy hardware and software on-prem. So this is truly an API-first solution. And all of this technology is bundled into two products or two world-class solutions as your slides shows you in front of you. And I'll talk about these with just one or two slides at the very end of my presentation, but 
there are two products. One's called Auto Steward, and the other is called Verado Universal MPI. But fundamentally, as I said, we're a software company founded in 2012, uh, very um, highly venture backed. So we've got some of the most um, well known venture capitalists in the country who've invested money in Verado in order to see our solution actually make a change in the marketplace, to make an improvement in healthcare in the United States. Um, we've got a very good large um, array of customers. You can see a handful of the logos here on this sheet. And I won't go through each one of them, but the important thing to note here is that it's, an, it's a very interesting mix of healthcare providers, hospital systems, as well as HIEs. And both HIEs and hospital systems both have patient matching problems. The problems differ greatly in the sense of how they're implemented. HIEs have less control about data standards, less control of um, data formatting for uh, what they receive from their hospital system members. They have far fewer people to do data stewardship. Um, so in a lot of ways, the problem of the HIE matching is could be considered the pinnacle of all patient matching challenges. Uh, but of course, hospital systems have patient matching challenges to deal with with respect to consolidating hospital systems and indeed delivering the care and delivering the care correctly. So in some ways, the need for extremely accurate patient matching isn't more, um, more importantly presented than it is at hospital systems and providers. But nonetheless, we're very proud of our customer base and we're very proud of the mission critical things that they're doing with Verado. And then just to uh, reiterate something Fred said there is that probably the reason or maybe the reason why you dialed into this, this webinar despite its somewhat arcane title of referential matching is the fact that this word or this phrase referential matching, this technology concept is now beginning to get an awful lot of notoriety and maybe the most important of which is, the, is this Pew uh, research study that was just completed uh, several months ago, culmination of two years worth of work. And they looked at all sorts of technologies that could move the needle on the patient matching problem. And ultimately, they narrowed down to four major things that are the biggest opportunities for improving patient matching, setting standards across the country, referential matching, the subject of this, of this um, webinar, mobile apps and how that might convey patient identities more surely to registrars, and biometrics uh, to be used in lieu of a patient ID. So an array of technologies, three of them are advanced technologies. One of them is simply a policy effort to standardize on data elements. But in total, these are the, these are the opportunities for improving patient identity across the U.S. spectrum of healthcare. And so we're proud that we're right in the middle of the referential matching uh, wave, if you will. Now let me set up this problem with a couple of slides uh, just to give you some context and to make sure we don't leave anybody behind. There are some concepts in here that you might already know second nature and I apologize if that's the case, but just bear with me for a few slides and then I think I'll be presenting to you things that you definitively uh, haven't been presented before. But the first thing is just what is patient matching? And fundamentally it, it connects human beings to their medical records or it connects medical records to medical records. Either way, the, the goal is to tie together information and associate it to a human being. So in uh, the way we look at this is you're going from wetware, human beings, and trying to tie it to hardware, or maybe you can call it software, the data about those human beings. And there are a lot of ways you can do this, but the only one universally accepted way, the thing that seems universally available to everybody, is the use of demographic data. Name, address, date of birth, social security, phone number, email. This is data that people carry around with them in their heads. They never forget, well, they shouldn't forget their name, address, and date of birth. Um, typically never do. And if those things are encoded in medical records as well as, you know, constantly at the tip of the tongue of the patients, then you would presume to have a perfect system. You can always tie a person to their medical records. In fact, I know definitively at my house there's nobody with my name and my address and my date of birth. So if there was absolutely no errors in the collection and the encoding of that data, then we would have perfect patient matching. But the problem is a little bit more complicated than that. One level of complication is that this name, address, date of birth is collected in a bunch of different systems, typically in one or more EHR systems, other specialty systems like the laboratory or diagnostics, billing systems. 
and from outside the organization. CMS might be um, have their own version of name, address, date of birth for a given person. And the goal of the technology, the EMPI, the Enterprise Master Patient Index, or the EHR system, the Electronic Health Record System, is to consolidate and reconcile those different identifiers so that there's one place to go to see where everybody, where a given person's data is, you know, where it resides. And the way it does that, I'll be describing to you in a few minutes, the state of the art for doing that today is this technique called probabilistic matching, where names are matched to other names, and if they're close, and we can probably think that they're the same name, a probabilistic matching system can make the connection. But the problem occurs is that fundamentally, our data is not correct. In fact, the data that's encoded, up to 30% of all demographic data that's captured or encoded in, in, in records is either incorrect, it's out of date, or it's substantially incomplete to the point where it can't be matched. And that's what this slide is intended to convey. Wherever you see those little red lines there is intended to imply that that data, name, address, or date of birth, or social security number, or phone number, is different or incorrect than what the current I guess you would call golden record, would be. And when that occurs, probabilistic systems often can't see through the degree of errors that are introduced. And that's where we get duplicates, that's where um, false positives, where overlays take place, is in this misinterpretation of errored identity data, demographic data. And this is kind of the state of the art today. It's not just the state of the art, it's the state of practice. We all are living in a world where a majority of our patient data is incorrect in our databases and therefore is incorrectly matched. And I'll give you a few statistics on that in a few moments. Um, but is this important? Why does patient matching matter? And um, does it matter enough that we need to do, some, where we have to make some changes? Historically, we did patient matching so that we could bill people properly so we could care for them better, or maybe just to ensure patient safety through uh, knowing what their allergies are as recorded in their records, and perhaps to reduce costs. You typically, you focus on redundant testing when you talk about patient matching and, and reduction of costs. And to a very large extent, our existing matching systems, our, initi our existing MPIs or EHRs, have done an adequate job of matching patients for three, these three purposes. And to some extent, that's why we don't feel, many people don't feel a driving need to fix patient matching because it seems like it's not perfect, but not bad enough to have to fix. But what's coming is new demands on the patient matching system. Uh, the first of, uh, at, uh, and so the newest ones are, are the business demands of hospital systems acquiring new hospital systems and having to merge patient records or becoming ACOs and needing to do much, uh, absorb CMS data or other data about people. Or new business initiatives of treating a patient more like a consumer that's to be won and managed. So I've heard these referred to as patient 360 strategies involving mobile apps and portals or CRM techniques. And there are new compliance uh, requirements, quality analytics that are required by hospital systems in order to get their full reimbursement from the government. So patient matching systems are having to do more patient matching from more sources in order to fulfill the, the hospital systems or the HIE's um, mission. And it's not stopping there. There's even more needs that are coming down the pike, typically in the category of emerging or innovation needs, such as clinician support apps that are going to be deployed, telemedicine or IoT sensors, social determinants of health or other lifestyle data. Hospital systems in particular are are in a position where they want to absorb and manage more data about their patients for economic reasons and for better care reasons. And it's this additional demand on the, and the MPI or the matching system where we see the real cracks are going to become, for, or we're going to see the real cracks forming uh, in how they operate. And in fact, we're starting to see those, those, those cracks now in the sense that in 2008, the widely reported uh, benchmark for duplicates, the average number of duplicate records in a given hospital system, was quoted at between 8 and 12 percent. But now in 2018, 10 years later, millions and millions of dollars spent 
thousands of people working in hospital systems all around the country trying to reduce duplicate records, we see that duplicate records haven't gotten better, it's actually gotten worse. Now the most widely quoted number for duplicate records in a hospital system is on the average 18%. And it's not that the technology has gotten worse, and it's not that people have gotten lazy, it's because more and more sources are hitting our MPIs, and as they do that, Every new source has the possibility of introducing new errors into the system, therefore creating or degrading the quality of the entire system. So this is what we're faced with as professionals. And there are real costs to these duplicate records. Uh, this next slide, which is probably too small of a font for you to really see it, so I'd encourage you to download this presentation if you want the latest statistics on cost uh, of, of duplicate records or or the cost of inaccurate patient matching, but they fall into the area of care and patient safety costs. Uh, there are business costs of denied claims or increased costs for patient stays. There are labor costs required for the manual resolution of medical records and duplicate medical records in particular on the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And there are strategic costs, simply the inability of the business, typically the healthcare business, uh, the hospital system, to, to pursue strategic initiatives. Um, often people don't mention patient matching as being the, the roadblock into these strategic initiatives, but if you peel back the onion a little bit, you often see that the, it's the inability to match patients which, be, which creates a fundamental roadblock. Now all of this, all of this uh, cost and um, increase in um, uh, duplicate records, I lay at the hands of this 20-year-old algorithm that's embedded in almost every MPI and every EHR product called probabilistic matching. It was invented in the 19, well, in 1969 at an IBM research facility, and the whole goal of probabilistic matching was to match records together when, the, when there is perceived error in the data itself. And as I already mentioned, 30% of all identity data is in error in some fashion, out of date, incorrect or incomplete enough where it prevents matching. So conventional MPIs using this kind of, uh, faced with this kind of data error rate, typically has only a 70% success rate in making correct matches. So not 100%, but 70%. And the difference between 70 and 100%, you'll see in a few moments in a slide, is made up for with manual data steward data resolution like human beings using human smarts to resolve identity questions as opposed to leaning on the machines to do it for us. Uh, and then the other critical problem that we're all facing with existing probabilistic matching is that it degrades the more sources that feed it. And that, again, is the, the root cause of this de degradation of uh, duplicate rates from 12% to 18% that we're seeing today. So this I'm setting up the problem. We have, this, we have this error rate in data. It matters and costs a lot. Probabilistic matching has gotten as good as it can ever get, and it's not good enough. So the question is, what do we do next? We can apply more people to the problem, hire an army of people, instead of relying on the machines to resolve identity days, but that would be incredibly costly and would take months to resolve identities instead of seconds, which is getting to be the new norm. So what I'm here to present to you is that the fact that I think the solution to this is something called referential matching, the next generation of patient matching. And just to contrast it with that three-part slide I showed you on probabilistic matching, referential matching is based upon the existence of a very large reference database, big data. And in fact, it's a self-learning database. The use of a new matching algorithm called referential matching or a referential algorithm that mimics human logic much more so than the slavish um, probabilistic matching. And it's all cloud-based so that people can simply plug into it rather than having to deploy it. It's much faster to deploy. Uh, let me give you a couple of slides as to what I'm talking about, because I know that slide didn't, it just teases you with the answer, but it doesn't really say how it works. The reference database is the foundation of referential matching, hence reference, referential matching, reference database. We have assembled a reference database through commercially available sources of, of identity data, aggregating data from the credit agencies, from an aggregator of telephone company, uh, telephone company subscriptions or telephone subscriptions, landlines and cell phones, 
and an aggregator of government and legal records, so land deeds, voter registration files, all of these things go into making uh, up our very, very large reference database of identities of people in the United States. And in fact, we have over 300 million, over 350 million identities now with 30 years of historical data. So it's not just the person's identity today, it's their identity as it's, as it's changed over a significant period of time. So that if we're ever faced with an old uh, medical record, somebody 10 years ago, we can match it to their new identity today because this reference database has the full spectrum of the history of their identity. And this database is continually updated. Every month it receives tens of millions of updates per month, so it's evergreen. It always stays fresh. And to this, um, to this data, it's not just that we acquired the data and jammed it into a database. We have applied over 100,000 hours of data science effort, you know, people whose sole mission it is to put together the most complete, correct picture of a person's identity so that it can be used for healthcare matching purposes. Um, and that's what's represented in this slide. That spider web you see in the middle of the slide is, represents a single identity and those little tinker toy um, colored balls that, that radiate out from that person represent that person's name as it's evolved over time, or their addresses as it's changed over time, or phone numbers that they've been acquired over time. And it's that constellation of identity data, that demographic data that resides in our reference database that becomes truly powerful for us in doing the matching. And that's what the next slide will show you. What this slide shows you graphically when I hit the animation button, it shows you how probabilistic matching works and referential matching works given two identities, A and B. So A in green and B in red. Believe it or not, those two geometric figures represent the same person, the same identity. It's just in one case, A, you might have the name, the address, and date of birth. And in B, you might have the married name, a different address, and perhaps the correct date of birth. So we have distinctly different information about the same person. With probabilistic matching, as I mentioned a moment ago, because it compares name to name, address to address, phone number to phone number, if there are significant discrepancies between names and addresses and phone numbers, probabilistic matching systems just can't make the match. In fact, even a human being couldn't make a match if the differences are so great. There's nothing that would put tie it together. But with referential matching on the right-hand side, if you presume that in that yellow database, that reference database, we have a picture of this person that includes both old addresses and new addresses, old names and new names, nicknames, correct names, old phone numbers, if it has a whole spectrum of data about the person, then you don't need to map A to B and see if there's enough overlap to declare a match. Instead, what you can do is you can map A to the reference database and B to the reference database and if both A and B land on the same reference identity, then A is the same person as B, even though the data about them that you're looking at seems to have no, very little correlation at all. And in simplest fashion, this is precisely what referential matching is about, using a reference database with a much greater array of data to make decisions that would be impossible to be made, even by a human being, otherwise. And I guess to just put a final point on this issue, and then I'll talk about um, how referential matching is constructed into products, you can think of probabilistic matching and referential matching against uh, these two probability curves. This is, any of you who have taken statistics, you recognize this as the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution. Here it's just being used as, a, as an illustration. But the point here is that in the spectrum of all the different kinds of errors that can occur in matching, some of the errors are very, very subtle, like twins have almost the same name, the same birthday, the same address, almost the same social security number, maybe even almost the same phone number. So that's at one end of the spectrum, perhaps on the far left of this diagram, you know, very subtle differences. And at the other end of the spectrum are the very gross differences. A person moves, changes their name, and uh, changes their gender, like some, some radical changes to identity. In those two outlying areas, matching systems fail. And in fact, probabilistic matching systems fail 30% of the time. They succeed 70% of the time in the 70% of the easy mainstream matching kind of questions. And for the two tails of this uh, probability curve, you have to apply human beings, data stewards, 
to try and make up the difference because the, the algorithm can't do it. With referential matching, you can get 90% match success. It is far more resilient at understanding fine nuances between twins or, or fathers and son identities. And it's far better at managing gross changes in people's identities, like changing your name and, and changing your uh, home location. So far fewer data stewards are required because the system itself can match a much higher percentage successfully. OK, let me talk very quickly about how to use referential matching. And my commitment is to get this over to Todd without too much more delay. But look, vendors are creating a lot of confusion with respect to referential matching. In fact, a lot of vendors are going to be saying, we are referential matching. And many of these vendors are vendors in the, in the uh, information spaces. And they've been providing services in the past to us data cleanup services. Look, data cleanup services does use a reference database, and it does help matching some degree. But as this diagram here, or this slide implies, you get only about 20% of the value of real referential matching by doing a data cleanup exercise. Identity pinning, where you reach out to a service and you get a, quote, universal ID from a vendor, and you use that universal ID as an aid in matching, that helps but perhaps only 40% is good as a referential matching system. And the other popular technique is this thing called data hydration, where you reach out to an information provider for identities that you're having difficulty matching, and you're saying to the information provider, please give me more information to work with, and I'll continue using my existing matching system. And that, too, is helpful, but again, it reaps only about 50% of the value of a real referential matching system. In fact, what I would tell you is that a real referential matching system does the entire matching process itself. Uh, and it does it in one of two ways. It either does it in the aid of an existing EHR or EMPI, so it augments your, the matching that you're currently doing simply by plugging your existing matching system into the, the referential service. That's number one on the screen in front of you. Or number two, it does it by um, offering a full referential matching MPI, so the entire MPI function is offered by the referential matching service. And that can get you to a full 90% of match success rates. Now let me just show you two, two or three slides on each one of these, and I'll turn it over to Todd. Look, the, um, the model where the referential matching system is making your EMPI or your EHR work better works like this. And I'll do a couple of builds so you can see it fill out. So if um, an existing system, an existing EHR system, is only delivering 70% of the match success rate, then an organization has to supplement that with, 20, uh, with human resources, data stewards. And these data stewards can get another 20% successful matches. You know, the other 10% end up as duplicates in our system. They just can't be resolved by human beings or, or technology. With referential matching as an augmentation to your existing EHR, your existing initiate EMPI system, you have a service provider like Verata's Auto Steward that, pl that you plug your EMPI into, and your EMPI sends to Verato not every single match decision, but just the hardest match decisions. And the referential matching system says, no, Mark Leroux is not the same as Mary Leroux. They're two separate people. Use that answer. And so what happens now is that instead of building up a very large list of tasks to send to data stewards, you have a much smaller set of tasks and a much smaller amount of effort that your human beings, your data stewards, have to execute in order to resolve what remains of the, un, uh, the unknown results. And this is a way of getting an immediate uh, cost reduction and better matching uh, instantaneously without upsetting any of your existing matching technologies, just augmenting what you currently have. And just a quick slide to show our success rate at resolving identities that the, these existing EMPIs or, EM, uh, or EHRs couldn't resolve. So the percentages you're looking at here across Epic and Cerner and IBM Initiate, Merck, et cetera, of all the identities that these existing systems couldn't resolve, this is the percentage that Ferrato's technology, referential matching, could resolve without any tuning, simply by plugging it in and immediately resolving over 50% and typically 75% of the hardest match decisions. And this obviously has a big cost impact. If you take a hospital of maybe 2 million patients, a duplicate rate of 
where it might take us data steward five minutes to resolve each of those um, duplicates that are generated each year, what you're talking about is eight data stewards and perhaps $400,000 a year in aggregate costs just to manage that duplicate workload. In a similar diagram, what we have here with the Verado Universal MPI, again on the left, without referential matching, you've got an implementation of perhaps 90% effectiveness with a lot of human beings. On the right-hand side, the, when, with the Verado Universal MPI using full referential matching, where the customer's Universal MPI database is linked uh, full-time to the reference database and receiving all of the benefits of its updates, what you can get now is a 90% match success rate and a much smaller uh, effort to steward the data. And the fact that it's a cloud-based system means that all the money you would spend in licenses, maintenance and support, implementation effort, tuning of the MPI, upgrades to the software, hardware, and the security that you put in place, all of that is covered with one subscription price and a much, much lower price at that. And because referential matching is more accurate, all the money and effort you would spend in data stewardship can be reduced to approximately one-fourth of what you were spending before. So it's a pretty compelling argument about accuracy and cost effectiveness, which is why people are so excited about referential matching. And to that end, what I'd like to do is now turn the, turn the microphone over to um, uh, Todd and have him tell you about his experience at HealthX. So Todd, go ahead. Hey, thank you, Mark. This is uh, Todd Rago, and uh, I think Nick introduced me earlier, but I'm the Senior Vice President and CIO at HealthX, and we're a health information exchange. So I'm going to walk you through kind of our experience um, with EMPIs and with Verado specifically. So here's the agenda here. So I'll tell you a little bit about HealthX to start off with, go into some of our challenges, um, and then why did we choose Verado, and then the results that we had after we uh, – chose Verado and move forward. So HealthX, a little bit about HealthX. We're uh, the, what we consider ourselves as the largest public HIE in the, the nation, so the United States. Um, we have over 28 million identities that's, that currently reside in our EMPI. What's, a, what's really interesting is um, those 28 million identities really boils down to um, 87.5 million MRNs. So these are individual identities that were sent into us as an HIE uh, to really aggregate to uh, figure out those individual identities um, to focus on. So we, we've got quite a challenge on our hands and this continues to grow. Um, on the next slide here, we, we show 17 million patients. So we have 17 million patients or members that we work with who have had recent data, and that's over the last couple of years. Uh, we work with over 700 healthcare organizations, um, and that represents uh, typically a territory that we cover is New York City and Long Island, um, and that covers about over 6,000 individual healthcare sites. So a lot of data coming in from a lot of different organizations. Um, our mission here on the right-hand side we supply secure data to improve healthcare quality, efficiency, and effectiveness. So we feel we have a good mission. Uh, we provide a range of clinical information in real time. We have a lot of real time alerts. And we really try to facilitate care coordination across our broad community. Um, here's some numbers just uh, in terms of the amount of data that we move around. So these are numbers pulled from August. Um, and these numbers have gone up a little bit since August. But overall, we bring in well over 50 million inbound messages. That's a combination of demographic updates as well as clinical updates into HealthX. And we push out, in terms of real-time updates, uh, 1.8 million on average every month of real-time updates to our customers, our participants in our community. And we also push out well over a million um, clinical summary documents. And in this case, they're typically pushed out as a continuity of care document. But of course, all of this depends on a solid foundation. Um, and that's what we'll get to in a second here. So I just, a little bit more about health and I don't want to bore anyone, but here's our mission, one, two, three, four. So we try to coordinate that care, complete view of the patient, 
um, the real-time services that we offer here under number two. And number three, we do offer um, risk and um, so risk deter determinant risk in different conditions, so predictive analytics on patients, um, and we try to make that data as actionable as possible. So it's predictive analytics that we offer. So we try to catch the patient before um, they show up in the healthcare system so we can reach out to them through care management, through our partners. And then uh, we do offer an opportunity to enrich other patient portals uh, throughout our community with, with records that they don't have within their own record. Here is an example of the diversity of the data sources that we collect today. So this really speaks well to how important identity management is. When you get information from all these different sectors, especially in the healthcare industry, you're getting this from behavioral health organizations, from hospice, from home, home care agencies. It's coming in from all sorts of places. Um, health plans is another big one. Um, in New York State, we also connect and coordinate the exchange of data between other public HIEs. Um, and then we also have uh, pharmacies, pharmacies and independent labs, which is also a big source of data into health ex. And, and typically, with some of these data sources, um, the data can be very sparse on patient identity. So the next slide here really talks about the types of data we receive. None of these should be unfamiliar with anyone on the call today, but we just bring in all sorts of data um, from SAMHSA data around substance abuse to immunization data, care plans. Um, we have EMS run sheets. These are the, the summary documents and they, when someone say drop you off into a hospital from an ambulance. And then obviously the encounter data with the demographics, et cetera, all rolling into Healthix. So let me let me switch into some of our challenges here around uh, our EMPI. So uh, we started working um, with Verado a little bit over two years ago, and what we were up against in that summer was a situation where we had a backlog of 10 million patient linkages that needed to be reviewed. Not a good situation to be in. Um, we crunched our numbers. We realized that we received over 10,000 new potential patient linkages that needed to be reviewed by a, by a person um, every day. And uh, <laughs> one of my first steps, which was maybe a misstep, but I started building out that army, as Mark had alluded to. We had an army of people who were right at their computers, um, worked with a great partner, and these people were just looking at patient identities all day long, in and out. And we just were not hitting the volume, the throughput that we needed to, uh, to really address the, both the backlog and the ongoing. Um, and then overall, you know, we're looking for a more efficient and automated way of handling patient matches. So why did we choose Verado? So let me talk about this. Um, so we went through a bake-off with several vendors and what really was highlighted out of this um, competition um, and why we chose Verado, we noticed the high accuracy in Verado's uh, matching. So in our bake-off, we had given a bunch of vendors who had uh, wanted to participate in this uh, 10,000 different patient uh, potential linkages. And we had said, take this, put it through your system, then bring us back the results and we'll examine it. And these are linkages which we already had. We already had a good basis from what our own system had already produced. And then we did look at the details around many of these um, in terms of why they differed from one vendor to another. And we really found that Barato was uh, did an excellent job at matching the patient identities. So they had a solid core. Um, also, being based out of New York City, extremely diverse. Um, city and state of New York. And so we have that challenge with patient names, uh, which, which can be, you know, very challenging, to be honest. And we really wanted to err on the conservative side. So we didn't want to be aggressive, uh, too aggressive in our patient identity matching and really bring identities that shouldn't be or are not the same people together, because obviously that just leads to further complications and, and bad data being moved out throughout the healthcare ecosystem. 
through HealthX. So we were looking for a partner that really had a, a good fit with HealthX, which is a little bit more on the conservative side. And if you can't match them, then let's keep those identities separate until new information comes in. So they did very well on that front. And then it was the processing time. Um, so the, the ability to process high volumes, as I said, that was one of our major issues, and the ability to scale as we were scaling and we continue to grow at HealthX. Um, and then the last bit here is really what Verado was able to bring to the table, unlike others at that time, was they had already built their uh, solution and service out in the cloud, uh, which really spoke to the scalability factor very well. But um, it also speaks to um, how quickly we were able to integrate to their solution and service. Um, I had a part-time developer who worked on this for a period of two months. Uh, we first implemented Auto Stewart, which was a great product. Um, and we're in the final throws just weeks away from switching completely to their universal MPI product uh, at HealthX. And I, I just want to allude back to the, the 10 million that we had in backlog here. Um, we found that we were able to process those 10 million in a matter of, I think it was about 10 days or so that we opened up the floodgates and they were able to process that high volume. 40% of that volume um, we were able to match. So these were all the maybes that were left over. Like we, our old system couldn't say no, they're separate. We couldn't say yes, they're the same individual. These are all the gray area. And leveraging um, the referential matching aspect of Verado um, was extremely powerful. So we were able to bring in 40% of those right away um, as uh, definite, yes, we will match. And there were some that fell into, no, please keep them apart. Um, and that was very helpful um, to not only catch up in terms of our uh, backlog, but also to make some headway. And let me show you some more of our results here. So as you can see on this slide, um, and this brings you back uh, to October 2016 uh, through the current date, which I've written in text format. And you can see the, the other nice thing, which kind of shows the power of referential matching, is the ability to have a higher percentage of MRNs, of these individual identities that we get sent at HealthX to the enterprise identity. And you can see that ratio goes from a, just like a two to one match to a 2.5, which is a 2.47 match. And now with our um, information coming from just last month, or actually it was early December, we're at a three to one match. So three MRNs typically per every identity uh, that we bring in. And so that ratio, first of all, that trend is the right trend that we wanna see. At HealthX, you know, the more data we get, the more we want to focus on keeping a very identified patient population. Um, so we're seeing the trend going the right direction. And just because of our growth and the, the amount of data we're seeing, the ability to work with um, a vendor like Verado, uh, lever leveraging referential uh, matching has been extremely powerful. And I think that is it. So. Uh, Thank you so much, and I'm definitely open for any questions. Yeah, thanks, Todd. It's Mark again. Hi, everybody. So, just ra so again, Todd. Thanks. What a I mean, a tremendous success. I mean, you uh, you completely turned around the, the the trends as you were pointing out, and the numbers were piling up. So, um, look, just to wrap this all up, and Todd mentioned this is that you know this is a cloud-based solution, so. It is in do it's designed to be fast to implement and low touch. Not a lot of tuning, actually virtually no tuning. You just plug it into your existing systems or have it respond to existing HL7 APIs and you're up and running. We worry about scale, we worry about response time, we worry about privacy. We've got um, so an extraordinary array of privacy certifications to keep all of our customers and all of our PII, PHI safe. And um, to get started, it's simple and easy. I mean, we've got two different introductory offerings. One's called a diagnostic, which in essence takes a referential X-ray of your existing MPI database and gives you a sense as to how many duplicates you have and what specific data issues, where the, what data problems are causing these duplicates. 
So it's very, it's very much like a healthcare X-ray. You know, it it looks inside in ways that are impossible for normal eyes to look, and gives you a sense of where you're sick and why. And then to the, and then um, beyond that, we also have a proof of concept or pilot program for customers that do like what Todd did, which is give us 10,000 or give us 100,000 identities or identity pairs, run it through referential matching, and compare the results with your existing probabilistic system. Um, make sure you see for yourself you know, what, we, what referential matching can do to make the business case to plug it in. Uh, with that, I'd like to stop talking and see if there are any questions uh, that you want us to answer. So, Fred? Yes, thanks, Mark and, and Todd. We do have some uh, some questions that have come in. Uh, I have one for for Todd here. Uh, Todd, how important is security when you're looking at at cloud cloud software such as this solution? Yeah, very good question. So, so you can see the amount of PHI that Healthix is handling today, and security is always on the forefront of our thoughts. Um, We've just gone through the high trust certification this year ourselves. We're waiting for the final paperwork. It's been submitted for three weeks now, so we're really excited about that. But what was great about uh, Verado um, is that they were already high trust certified. So that, you know, the SOC 2 audit is a good audit. High trust has become one of our standards today that we really look for in a vendor. And uh, we continue to, to do this with all of our other vendors, look for that high trust standard. Um, and, and, and keeping security, you know, at the foremost uh, in our thoughts. Uh, obviously extremely important uh, to feel that that data is secure. Um, in addition, I guess, what kind of benefits and feedback have you seen downstream, uh, you know, from participants and other consumers of the data? Is this, uh, Fred, is this for me or for Todd? Uh, well, oh, it might be good for uh, Todd for starters, and, and Mark, maybe you could chime in okay. as well, but I think it was intended for Todd. Okay. Yeah, I, I have no problem. Um, so the, there are benefits in, in two directions for us. So um, in the state of New York, there's also a statewide EMPI, which manages the identities across other HIEs and a few other uh, state-run agencies in New York State. So HealthX is one of the major feeder systems into that. So the better matching that we're able to kind of pull out as a result of the work we've already done with Verado and the work we're just finalizing now really benefits the statewide EMPI as well. And then you've got our customers, which are those healthcare organizations that we work with. And what's, what's really fascinating is in the past we've, we've – um, We've obviously looked for situations like patient identity overlays and stuff like that. And in 2019, we plan on working with Verado and offering a new service, uh, which isn't new in principle, but it's a new service for HealthX of really reaching out and letting them know as they send their data into HealthX that, hey, that just caused an overlay. And it looks like you may have the same situation coming from your IDN or your hospital organization or large practice. Uh, so that's a service we're excited to move towards uh, in early 2019. But we've already seen the benefits. We've already been doing this on a manual level, uh, just reaching out to the billing departments of these organizations to help correct these identities. That's part of our correction process uh, to keep this, keep our house in order, really, on patient identity. Yeah, from a that's perhaps from the HIE perspective, from the provider perspective. I'm not a provider, obviously, but. Our customers who are providers would probably tell you that the benefits that they've seen now is um, the reduction in denied claims and the reduction in effort in managing the duplicate backlogs. Those two cost offsets are probably the most visible benefits of going to referential matching. Um, the less visible or less easily calculable ones are probably the consolidation ease. So being able to accommodate the acquisition of new hospitals or consolidation of EHR products uh, is probably the next most important thing that our provider customers would claim. Uh, there's probably some value just to the uh, re relief of uh, you know, reducing the amount of mistakes and uncertainty and, and all that in terms of you know, patient matching and such. 
um, uh, did you uh, Todd, did you see the same results continue into 2018 after you made this transition? Yeah, so it's a good thing, and I alluded to the trend line. That we're definitely we've been moving in the right direction, and and that positive trend continues. Where um, even though Healthix is growing substantially every month, we bring on just to give people an understanding, we bring on on average 30 new organizations on a monthly basis at Healthix. Um, a lot of these are smaller practices, but still they bring with them a new identity for that patient, and, and matching those identities is really important uh, to kind of boil down to that unique uh, person. So the trend line's going in the right direction, uh, even as our complexity of data from data sources to number of data sources has grown. Um, so we've been very happy with, with how things are going. I don't think there's a perfect silver bullet out there in the marketplace that's going to get that 100%. Um, you know, maybe someday biometrics or our cell phones will play into this that will help the patient be more um, engaged directly in this process. But uh, right now we're really happy to be uh, in a situation that we're in. Definitely uh, as we continue to grow, we're moving in the right, right direction. With these smaller uh, provider organizations, Todd, are there certain uh, challenges associated with them in terms of uh, assimilate, assimilating data and harmonizing that, that information? Uh, are they harder to work with, easier? What, what's your take on, on these smaller organizations? The, um, so the, the one challenge that that, I, that we have as an HIE and, and just getting the data out of small organizations is, you know, these, these types of organizations typically you don't have an IT staff, so we have to work directly with a vendor, which, is, which can be a very positive experience. Um, and we, we've had that experience with well over 20 different vendors in a special program that we have uh, to really do that data integration, which includes the demographics, but obviously the clinical data. Um, I think that's the challenge is these days, you know, more and more it really comes down to not is the technology there, but, you know, who can you really communicate with to leverage that technology and make the best use of it as possible. So when you're dealing with a small solo doc practices all the way down to the smallest practice, they don't have time. They just want to see the patients. And one of the, what we want to do as an HIE is really support what they want to do. Right? They want to talk to the patients. They want to treat the patients. We want to make this data as easily accessible to them as possible. And identity matching is the core of that. Right? Without a proper identity match, then, then our service is, is uh, not going to be as effective. So uh, that would be the one challenge I would highlight. Great. Uh, in, in in going this route, did you have to make any major modifications to your software or workflow to, to use Verado? So we had to make some modifications, but um, their APIs were very well documented. So that's, that's always a pleasant experience when we have solid documentation to work from. Um, now, we, we very well supported in the process the Verado team it was always there when we needed them, and my developer, I did put an experienced developer on the integration project, but he was able to work through the, the data flow, um, both out to the Verado uh, Auto Stewart product uh, to begin with, and then also the return of the results and incorporating those, those results into a different vendor's EMPI, which we leverage today. Um, that was a pretty smooth process. Um, Unlike some other IT projects, uh, this one went very smoothly. And then the current project that we're in right now, which is really moving to Verado for our full, for their universal MPI product, um, we're really excited. We're already, we've already loaded the majority of our uh, demographic data into um, their product. This is from our legacy system into the new system. And we're already seeing a further reduction of uh, enterprise identities. So that's really exciting to us. We've been looking at those in detail, making sure that it's a proper match and we're happy with the results. Um, so again, we feel like this, this next step for HealthX is really moving in the right direction. And because of it, our, our customers will benefit and the state of New York will also benefit uh, as we feed this information up into the statewide service. 
um, Todd, what what kind of feedback mechanisms or, or processes are in place for the for records to be updated in the hospital environment? It's uh, a question from a participant. Yeah, so t you know, today I, I alluded to a new service coming out in uh, early 2019. We hope to automate this a little bit and to to produce reports that our customer base can have access to, um, and this would mainly highlight those um, patients that look 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 ugh, excuse me look like there's an overlay situation, which means maybe they used two different MRNs to represent Todd Rago. Um, and we catch that on our end, and we want to have them corrected in their system so they can properly uh, fix that and send us the, the fix. Um, today, we handle this process in a manual way um, where we go in and we do see these overlay situations, or in some cases, they're reported to us by our users. Um, and we work back with the, the medical uh, records department at, at some of the larger organizations who have those and uh, really work with them manually today. It's the old, you know, by phone <laughs> and uh, secure email um, and get these addressed and corrected. Our general stance at HealthX is we don't want to manipulate the data um, at the HIE level. So if there is a correction to make, we want to push it back to the center of the data. And that way it gets correct from the very beginning where, where it originates from and it populates through both HealthX and then above HealthX to other uh, sources that we feed. So that's our general rule of thumb is to fix it at the source and have that populate in a, in a proper way through the rest of the ecosystem. Great. Uh, that's got to be a confounding thing to, to work on manually, so automating it would be terrific. Um, well, I see we are exactly at the top of the hour. I will promise to stop grilling Todd with all kinds of questions. Um, uh, for those who have attended, we, we appreciate your attendance today. If you want to download the uh, PDFs, I think you can do that from the, uh, uh, the sort of resources panel in the middle of your screen, and you can certainly download these uh, slides for, for your future uh, reference and, and review. And we just wanted to thank you so much for attending uh, this uh, informative web seminar this uh, this afternoon or this morning if you happen to be on the on the west coast. Uh, we appreciate uh, you uh, being here, and uh, we wish you a good and productive rest of your day. Thank you. So